need to take a second to say thank you to a woman by the name of Sarah. Username Easy Like Sun Mourn. For reaching out to me on a comment about a woman named Dawn that I spoke on a while back that was battling cancer. Another friend of hers named Michelle Jester reached out in the comments section stating that Dawn succumbed to her battle with cancer. November 8th, 2021. She lost her mom shortly before that and kind of spiraled. My heart goes out to Dawn, the people that loved her, that she left behind. It's just an altogether heartbreaking thing. For my subscribers, longtime viewers, y'all remember I did a prayers for Dawn thing. She'd been battling this cancer for many years. She was a soldier, she was a fighter. And I've heard so many good things about her. But she left this earth November 8th, 2021. She doesn't she doesn't have to suffer anymore. The fight is over. And I just once again wanted to say thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Michelle Jester. And rest in peace, Dawn. Please pray for her family and anyone that would have loved her, cared about her. When somebody dies, it's not just someone leaves. It's much deeper than that. It hurts those that love them, those that remembered them. And it's not so much the death that hurts everybody. It's knowing that you and this person will never see each other again in this lifetime. So once again, prayers for Dawn, Dawn's family. Rest in peace, Dawn. Fly high. Man, you already know what it is. Jake Williams, let's live life, and we're back. Being locked up is stressful. Stressful for a lot of different reasons. Everybody thinks, well, because you're going to get in a fight, or somebody might try to take something from you. There's always the physical aspect of it. But to be honest, most of the worst parts of being locked up come from up here. It's not what you would think. It's not the everyday talked about stuff that makes it hard to be locked up. Today, we're going to do a top five worst things about incarceration. You can't even begin to believe what's on this list. You might guess a couple, but you're not really going to get it. For ex-cons, people that have done a significant amount of time, they're going to, not for a fuck attack. I'm going to say, yeah, that's definitely a fact. I enjoy doing videos like this because it lets people know what to expect if you get locked up, what to do, what not to do, what comes with the territory, yada, yada, yada. So that's what we're on now. Top five worst things about being locked up. Real quick, shout out to Bubblegum Big League Chew. Love this hat. When I get a dope hat, I have a lot of hats. When I get a dope hat that I like, I'll shout it out. This is by far one of my favorites right now. Also got a cotton candy New York Yankees hat. I don't do many Yankees hats. Nothing against the Yankees, nothing against New York. Big love and shout out and salute to New York. But I had to have that hat. You know, I do more Boston hats than anything and Chicago hats. But some Yankee fitters are just, they're fire. They're like that. I had to have it. I'm freaking out a little bit because I deleted some of my videos and I think I deleted part two to the the Pinky Pound video. So I'm gonna have to reach out to Google, have them email me my videos. I believe I can do that to have my videos restored. I was just deleting old stuff and I think I deleted it. Just had to share that with y'all as well. One more quick thing. I will not be moving to the beach. Got off work yesterday, standing in my backyard, watching my son run, watching we got three small dogs, Nico, which y'all met, and then the two miniature poodles. And they love the backyard. They love the grass. And I can't take that from them. Not to mention the apartment on the ocean front. It's very small closets. We have a, between me and my wife, we have a very large wardrobe. And I'm not getting rid of all my clothes, hats, and shoes to live in an apartment on the ocean. Plus, my son needs to be able to run around. You got tourist season down at the beach where Got all the out-of-towners, and that's cool if you go there for a couple of days, but it's never really peaceful when that's your 
everyday life and you have to park in a parking garage and you know you got people up to no good bars letting out and that's not what I want my son raised around I love the idea at first just based on the fact that there's the rooftop that looks at the ocean I could do my videos with the ocean in the background and the sun setting and everything that comes with the beach you know me and my, my family my kids we could go out on the beach take the animals out on the beach whenever we want it but you lose the overall privacy that comes with having a house. You lose that serenity, that peace of mind. And that's why they call it a vacation. It's something you can go do to get away every now and then. But living somewhere where it's just straight tourism and tourists all the time, that's not a vacation. It's, that will quickly become a headache. So I will not be leaving the 804 and headed to 757. Staying put right here in Richmond. So... Without further ado, let's get into top five worst things about being locked. Coming in at number five, the altogether feeling of just being helpless. Helplessness, if that's a word. Lack of control. Let me break this down to you. I've made videos in the past where I break down things I saw, things I heard, things that happened to guys, events, traumatic things that had to witness others go through. Then people, and these are usually people that have never done time, will comment and say, how could guys stand by and just watch something like that? Why didn't you jump in and do something? Why didn't somebody do something? You're pretty much helpless in those situations. Guys put themselves in situations, don't heed the warnings from others, they're new. They think they're smarter than everybody else. Just going to figure it out on their own. And they end up in jams. They end up in really tough spots. It could be anything from somebody trying to violate them. To somebody physically trying to harm them by putting them mitts on them. Beating them up. Extorting them. Stealing from them. Robbing them. The list goes on and on. You see these things take place and to say, to put it in just the best terms, it sucks. And there's nothing you can or you're going to do about it. Unless it's somebody you really, really mess with. If it's your homeboy, somebody you know, you've been down with a while, somebody, like I said, that you'll go to bat for, yeah, you're going to jump out there. Because you're willing to take whatever comes with it to protect that person. Because that's your friend. But when it comes to somebody you don't know, somebody that has put themselves in that situation, in harm's way, you can't just be Superman. There is no cape. You don't just run, jump in a phone booth and dun dun dun, dun come charge or not and run over there and save the day. Uh-uh. You better not. Whatever that man just had going on has now become your problem. Not getting involved is what you're supposed to do. That's the rules. That's the prison code. That's the politic. Mind your own. Stay out of other people's business. This man and that man got a problem. You feel sorry for that man. You go over there and you intervene. Guess what's going to happen? He's going to forget about him for the moment and turn his attention to you. So what you just felt bad for watching that man go through is now going to become your issue. What are you going to do when you go over there and you say, hey, I don't like what you're doing, buddy. And the guy pulls out a 10-inch knife and says, what are you going to do about it? Now you're in a situation where you done butted your nose in somebody else's business and you can lose your life. Or what if in the middle of you trying to tell him, hey, don't do that, he punches you and knocks your front two teeth out. Now you've got to fight with him. Now you're going to the hole. Maybe you win. Maybe you hurt him. Now you're going to court. At the end of the day, you're going to be the one that ends up jammed up. And that guy you were defending, chances are, he's going to end up right back in that situation. Because he's not used to doing time. He's going to make the same mistakes over and over and over. You defend him once, you take him to raise. You defend him once and then you put yourself in a situation only to see him do the same thing again a couple weeks later. Now you're going to be mad at him. I've gone to bat for guys early on 
in my bed, seeing somebody I didn't like, and would stand up for a guy and get into it with the guy that he's got a, a beef with. And then I would turn around and see the dude do the same thing. I had a friend of mine one time that owed all these people this money that he'd been store boxing, gambling, ran up this big ass debt. And these dudes were ready to do something to him. They were going to hurt him. I halfway, he was, I'm not gonna say, let me rephrase that. I'm not gonna say he was a friend, he was an associate. I was young, I was green. Wasn't fully hip to the game yet. What did I do? I went to these dudes. Hey, I need to clear his debt, man. Don't give him nothing else. But I'm going to make it right. There's no way he can possibly pay y'all. I know y'all are going to hurt him. I've seen these guys hurt people in the past. I'm going to take care of his debt. He can't pay y'all. Lay off of him. I'll take care of it. I just inherited his debt. With that, I also just inherited any beef that comes. Now it's my job to pay it. And if I don't pay it, they're not looking to do anything to him. They're looking to do it to me. I paid off the man's debt. And it wouldn't be but a couple weeks later after his slate was wiped clean that he was in debt again and ultimately ended up getting hurt. I put my nose where it shouldn't have belonged, jumped out there to try to help somebody get out of a situation and watch them put themselves right back in it. Lack of control. Let's break that down. You will not control the jail. You will not control the prison. The people that run the prisons. It makes like to say, man, we run this, we run this. No, you don't. Because if you ran it, you would go home. If you ran it, you would go over to the commissary and take what you want. If you ran it, you would come and go as you please. We don't run it. We do what we're told. For the guys that think they do run it, they end up doing all the time in confinement. But you literally have no control over your life. The guards, the institution, the state, they control your life. And them situations where you see a man being victimized, you have no control over him, the situation, the subject at hand. Whatever somebody is deciding to do to him, they're going to do. Well, Jay, why y'all just stand by and watch that man do that? Let me tell you something. Unless you're gang related, which I am not, there is no real strength in numbers. I've got a couple of homeboys, but I ain't got hundreds of homeboys. There's no real unity in prison when it comes to convicts and inmates. There's just not. And I can prove this to you in one small theory. There are a handful of guards on any given day working their shifts. Larger prisons like Greensville, let's say there's, you know, 3,700 inmates. There might be on that shift anywhere from 50 to 70 guards working that entire prison for almost 4,000 inmates. Here's why I say there's no unity. How do they keep us in? The fences, right? Razor wire, a guard in a tower with a gun, vehicles that ride around outside the prison making sure nobody's escaping. If there was really unity amongst us inmates and we had control, at any given moment, we could walk over there, everybody just put two fingers through the chain link fence, and over 3,000 inmates, we could pull the fence down and walk right over top of it. We could walk up next to the next fence as they fire their guns, put our fingers to the fence, not even your whole hand. That's that many people pull the fence and walk down over top of it. But there is no unity. And when God sees somebody going through something, everybody's not going to speak up. If they did, there would be no such thing as booty bandits. Jay, how y'all going to stand by and watch this man do that? Go over there and do something about it. Go do something about it. If you ain't never stepped up and been the one to do something about it, don't speak on it. That man is six foot seven, 360 pounds, will grab you and do what he wants to. He can grab you by your neck and choke you, choke you till he feels the life leave your body. You want to die? And if he doesn't kill you, now you're in a situation where you got to kill him. It's fight or flight. It's definitely fight because you done Put yourself in a situation. You can't run from it because there ain't nowhere to go. This ain't the real world where you can talk shit on the phone or hey, be a little troll on the keyboard and go back to your regular little life. No. This is prison. Where you're going to have to stand up behind what you do. The things you, see, you say are going to be tested. The fabric of what makes you a man or a woman is going to be tested. 
So when you put yourself in that situation, trying to help that next man, you better be ready to take it there. What happens when it gets there? Do you win? If you beat him, say y'all go at it. You and this man go to war. Man, you're not going to keep extorting that little dude. Or you're not going to keep beating up your little cellmate. Or why are you messing with the old man? And you and his, you go at it with the dude that's doing it. And you beat him. Worst case scenario, you kill him. Defending somebody else. You just went from having a release date to not having a release date. This is not the movies. If you kill someone in prison, it's the same as killing someone out here in the world. You're never coming home. You just turned a couple years into a life sentence because you tried to help somebody. That's why I said you become helpless. Lack of control. These are the things you don't think about. It is a sickening, gut-wrenching, dirty, disgusting feeling watching a whole entire piece of human garbage take advantage of somebody else, hurt somebody else, and all you could do is stand by and watch. I didn't make the rules. I don't make the politics. I came into prison like every other man. And my mission and goal is to keep Jay safe and to get home to my family. Not have to call them and say, well, I tried to defend another guy in here that was being bullied and I hurt somebody really bad. Tell my son, I'm sorry, but I might not never be coming home now. You have to mind your business. You're going to see things you don't like. You're going to hear things you don't like. And if you put yourself in situations you shouldn't be in, well, you may just end up on the receiving end of all the things you don't like. So that was number five. Helpless. Lack of control. You go in there, you'll understand real quick why I said you mind your business and you stay out of others. That man's problems will pause, not be his problems, become your problems. And then when the situation is settled with you and that man, that man is going to go back and that dude still going to have those problems. Let's get into number four. Coming in at number four, the lack of feeling and emotions. I know a lot of people going to be like, come on, big dog, you got to man up. When I'm in there, and love don't live here no more. You're right. Getting locked up, being incarcerated. Not a whole lot of emotions you can be able to deal with other than anger and happiness. When you're sad, there's nobody to turn to. Nobody to talk to. Most men aren't going to look at their cellmate and say, Dog, I'm sad, man. Somebody's going, what the hell, man? If you don't go to sleep or... Carry your soft ass on somewhere when in reality, he gets sad too. That lack of, and when I say emotion, that comes with physical, the aspect of the physical touch as well. The lack of all that is just, it's cold, it's bitter, it's it's lonely. Being locked up is one of the most, it's one of the most loneliest things you'll ever experience. Especially considering that you are constantly around people. There are people around you all day, every day, every race, every type of individual you could think about is around you, but you're lonely. I hear this a lot. I'm cold. I don't know how to communicate well. I, I'm numb. I don't express emotions like the normal person does. I've heard that a million times. Not just from my wife, but in past relationships as well. I want you to do this. Imagine sleeping on a little skinny mat. About the equivalent of a gym mat from high school. A little green mat with a sheet on it. A sheet on you and a wool blanket. And that's all you have. Year after year after year. There's no warm body next to you. Nobody to make love to, nobody to say, I love you too, nobody to greet you in the morning, nobody to hug you when you need a hug, no one to tell you, hey, you look nice today, you smell nice, I'm proud of you, all of that is stripped away from you the moment you get locked up, 
I slept by myself, was alone for such a long period of time that even to this day, a lot of that is transferred to the streets. I still sleep on my side. I sleep on my left side. And that's because when I slept, you know, when I was locked up, I slept on my left side with my back to the wall. That way I could just roll and be straight up. I didn't sleep on my back. I slept on my side facing the cell door. When I was in a dorm and I slept in the back on the back wall, on the back bunk, I slept on my side. So that any moment I could roll up and go in that direction. Emotions are a big part of what makes us human. A man with no emotion, you know, no type of love in him is a dangerous man. The penitentiary is full of men just like that. Men that forgot how to love, what it felt like to be loved, that do not know or remember that soft caressing touch that comes from a woman. I became that person after a while. I would go to those visits and I would see family members, people that I cared about, and then they would leave and it was a sickening feeling. It was sickening to know that the most affection I would receive would be for an hour and then it would be gone. I would get on that phone and at times there was people I'd talked to from the past that would say, I love you at the end of the conversation, ex-girlfriends, things like that. And when they said that, my response would be like, I will take care of yourself. I expected to get left behind, done wrong. I expected them to disappear from my life. You don't know what loneliness is until you're surrounded by nothing but men. If you're gay, and you're willing to indulge with other inmates, then this might be the best of both worlds for you. But for straight men like myself that are incarcerated and there's no women around, you have no options, zero. For a gay man, he's got all types of options. But for straight guys like myself, there are no options other than to be alone. When something happens, you call home, such and such died. You get off that phone. You have to maintain the image you put out. You have to continue to be this tough guy in front of all these other men. You're dying inside. Just got bad news. Somebody you love is dead. You walk off from that phone with a grin on your face. You can't cry, so you're angry. People try to, hey, you all right? Leave me alone, man. So instead of being able to reach out to someone and let them know that you're hurting inside. You could possibly reach out in a violent manner because you can't express your emotions. You bottle them up. I came home and I had so much bottled up that the first time I really just sat down and reflected on everything I had been through and I actually cried and I let it all out. It was a, a scary, scary feeling. I had so much coming to surface all at one time that it was damn near overwhelming. Things I hadn't thought about, situations I hadn't dealt with, I never had come to terms with. Now I'm free. All these emotions are rushing me. The emotions that, that come with, oh my God, these people let me go. I'm out here. The air just smells different. There's females, there's family members. I have all these options of things I can eat. Then you think about everything you just went through, the people you left behind, and the emotions come. All the pain, the frustration, the anger, everything you've held in for all those years that you couldn't show anybody else, it comes pouring out. I sobbed like a little boy, man. Huh? I remember that day I got out, my mom had a barbecue and family over for me. And as everybody was doing all that, I got to thinking, about my friends, the guys I left behind. Thinking about everything that I've been through in the last decade. And I walked out my mom's back door, stood there on the steps, and I just completely broke down. I can't tell you the last time I had shed tears prior to that. But in the moment you would think that I would be so happy, all those years of pent-up aggression, hidden emotion, 
sorrow, sadness came to surface. And my mom walked out back and see me crying. Like I was in a zone. I, I couldn't hear anything. It was almost like I just woke up from being knocked out. Everything was just kind of ringing and quiet. Even though there was noise going around, everything got real quiet. And the next thing I remember was my mom touched my shoulder and it kind of startled me. And I turned around and looked at her and there was just tears pouring from my face. She said, you all right? I said, yeah, I'm okay. It's the same day I got out of prison. What's wrong? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know what's wrong? Mom, I don't know what's wrong. What had happened was I finally was coming to terms with not just one or two events or the fact that I was free. I was finally able to express how I felt and come to terms with everything that had happened over the last decade, over the last 10 years, everything I had held inside that I could not turn to anybody else with had come to a head and had come to the surface. That's why I put number four as emotions. Nobody wants to hang around the guy that's always crying or the guy that's always sad or, hey man, I'm kind of feeling down today, buddy. Would you like to talk? You don't know, carry your whack ass on over there somewhere talking about how you feel. Man, we don't do that up in here. I get chills just thinking about it. I hug my children every day and I tell them I love them. I don't want to let them go at times. My four-year-old, I'll kiss him right in his mouth. Come here, boy. I'll kiss my four-year-old right in the mouth. I love that. Makes me feel magical, special. I don't ever want him to get any bigger, man. I know that's selfish of me. Because I know one day he's going to be too big to kiss his dad on the mouth. Come on, dad. You don't, want to, don't be trying to kiss me in the mouth. You weird or something? You're my son. I love being able to express myself to people. Even with y'all. I love to let y'all know when I'm happy. You can see when I'm sad. You can see when I'm angry. But like I said, when it comes to prison, jail, incarcerations, the only real emotions you're going to see are happiness and anger. Everything else really doesn't matter. Coming in at number three, waiting. You will wait to do everything. Are you a patient man? Are you a patient woman? If not, you will become. Everything is a waiting game while locked up. You can use a shower. There's a line of 10 people getting in the shower. Who's got next on the shower? Not who's last in line. Who's next? If you ask who's last, then that gives people that are in the line the opportunity to say, well, he had it in front of me. He had it in front of me. Might have been six people, but now you let your homeboy jump in the line. I didn't quickly turn into 15 people. You're going to wait to do everything. You want to make something in the microwave? You got to wait to get in the microwave. There's a line. Visiting day. People come to see you. You ain't seen nobody in a while. You're all dressed up. From the time your visitors get there to the time they make it to the visiting room, it could be an hour, hour and a half. You're going to wait just to get on that phone, to talk to your people, to see when they're going to be there. You're going to wait. I got sick one time, me and my, my old Sally Woody. Woody gets out this year in October. And I have an awesome painting Woody sent me, by the way. I need to show you all. Self-taught man's amazing. After doing 25 years, Woody will be coming home this October. Me and Woody had the norovirus back in the day, like 2011, I believe. We were definitely ill. So we're going to die in that cell. We put a request form in the medical, emergency request form. Hey, we're sick. There's something seriously wrong with us. We need to see a doctor. It would be three days before they got us over to medical to see a nurse. By that point, our stomachs had balled up in knots. Explosive diarrhea. Projectile vomiting, sweating, laying in the bed, just feeling like you're on your deathbed. And it took us three days to get to medical because there's so many other guys that you have to wait. But the story of my homeboy Fly, who was five months from going home, getting over to medical was a process. Told the medical staff he didn't feel good. He was throwing up blood. They told him, fill out a form. You'll be seen in medical. They took him over to medical, told him he had kidney stones. This is a week after he's told them he's throwing up blood. Flower would end up 
puking up blood everywhere in the bathroom, falling out on the floor, and we went and got the, the guards, and they got him over to medical. And because he had to wait, and everything was, they'll get to you when they get to you, by the time his cancer was diagnosed, he only had a couple months left to live. From the time they diagnosed him, it was less than 90 days he was dead. He never made it to the five month mark, never made it to get home because he had to wait. They say patience is a virtue. You've never met a more patient person than someone that has been locked up. If you are indigent, indigent is the act of having no money. You have no help on the outside world. This could be for many reasons. Your people could be poor, struggling just to get by. Your people could suffer from some type of substance abuse, whether it be alcohol, drugs, something of that nature, and all their money be dedicated to that. And then I've met people whose families were loaded, but they refused to help the son, the nephew, the grandbaby, whoever that was locked up because you wanted to go out and be a criminal. Get yourself locked up. Or you can sit in there and be hungry with your silly ass. What you need money for in jail? A lot of people don't understand that you need money. You can't. You're going to eat what they feed you. You're not going to commissary. You're going to wash your ass with that soap they give you that dries you out. They're going to give you a little bottle of state shampoo, state toothpaste, all the stuff the state supplies to you. It does the job, but it's not ideal. It's pretty much what, you know, they would give to a, a camp somewhere full of refugees or something. It's like Red Cross medical supplies or, you know, it's just bottom shelf. With being indigent, you rely on the state to feed you. Every bit of food that's going to go in your stomach is coming from the jail or the prison. You go eat breakfast, you're hungry. Not a whole lot of food on the tray. You will survive by eating state trays. You ain't never seen nobody go to jail super skinny and come out skinnier than they went in. You're going to eat, and they're going to start you to death. You're going to eat potatoes three times a day. You're going to have potatoes at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. going to feed you a lot of cabbage, a lot of beans, things that are cost-effective and that put weight on you. But if all you get are those state trays because you fall into that category of indigent we just talked about, well, then you're going to have to wait to eat. The luxury of your refrigerator is no longer there. The store is no longer there. At Greensville, sometimes we would go, every, every time it was two weeks, but then every few months we would skip a week. So it'd be three weeks before you go to commissary. You done gobbled up all your zoom zooms and wham whams. You done made all types of swole, shing ding, chi chi. You done made all these different meals right out the gate. You done ran out of commissary. Your ribs are touching. You feel your heart and your backbone touching. Your stomach is tight. You don't see commissary for another three, week, three weeks. You have to wait. Waiting is by far stressful. Tell the guard you need something, I'll get to you. You got an issue, I'll get to you. Hey, I need, you're gonna have to wait. If you are not a patient person, you're bossy. You want everything right when you want it. Everything's gotta be your way. But to keep your dumb ass out of the lockup, because when you get in there, the one thing that's guaranteed is you can do a whole lot of waiting. Waiting on everything you can imagine. But there's one thing you're waiting on more than anything. You're waiting to be released. Coming in at number two, the disrespect and being treated less than human. Hear me now. The disrespect that you're going to receive and being treated less than human. The guards are taught when they go through the academy to not fraternize with the inmates, to not talk with the inmates unless it's work related or got something to do with the prison or the jail. So when you go to them and you have an issue, they handle it almost as if a robot was handling it or they handle it with some type of attitude. You're gonna feel disrespected. You have certain guards at times that walk around with a chip on their shoulder and you could be having the best day that a man can have while locked up. And then you look over and you see this guard 
and your whole day just goes to crap right then and there. This man can be disrespectful, rude, obnoxious, and get away with it. Nothing you can do about it. You can write him up on paperwork. Hey, your guard got in my face, called me a bitch, and said, do something about it, punk. And you know what? The paper you're writing is going to go to somebody that he works with. And they're going to read him like, oh, man, he called dude a punk. You said he was a bitch. Yeah, he is a bitch. And they're going to tear it up and throw it in the trash. The guards will disrespect you to the point that you just want to explode. And you know that if you so much as push him, he's going to press assault charges on you. The level of disrespect you will receive from other inmates at times is unfathomable. Especially when you're locked behind that door. When you find yourself in confinement. You find yourself in the hole. I had an issue with a dude one time that was being shipped. And we're in the hole. And this dude would just talk. Cash shit to everybody back there. I'll do this. This about your mama. This about your sister. Man, I'll get home and go see your girl. And like, this dude was talking crazy outside of his neck. And there's nothing you can do about it. They used to take us all from the hole and put us in a big dog cage for our one hour record day. We got out, it's 23 and one. One hour a day, we got to come out that cage, right? I mean, out the cell and into that cage. This guy wouldn't go to wreck. So he would run his mouth every day disrespecting you, calling you the worst names you could ever imagine to the point that your blood pressure is boiling. Your blood is just, you can feel it trying to push its way out the top of your head. You feel like you're going to explode and there's nothing you can do because he's going to get shipped. Then you'll have other guys in the jail. I've seen situations where guys know that people are coming to bond them out in the morning and they get on that door and start talking. Man, you lucky I'm leaving in the morning. I was going to punch you and doing all this and got everybody else hearing what this man is saying to you. And all you're thinking is, please, God, don't let him make bail before I get my hands on him. Let us come out this cell for just 45 seconds in the morning before they call his name so I can hurt him because this man is disrespecting me past the point of what I can take and I'm going to hurt him. And there's nothing you can do about it. Those females that you got on the streets that loved you, that were one way to you, that were there for you, over time they start to get angry at you. It goes from you calling and laughing on the phone and I had this happen on my last bid to them being mad at you. I was with this Puerto Rican chick prior to me getting incarcerated. This was my actual girl at the time. I was working at the strip club. She was the girl that when you came, I checked ID. She was the girl that you go to get ones from. And, you know, she would give you a T-shirt to sit under 21 if you were 18. Me and her were real close in the short amount of time we were together. She was the one that took me to court, told me, no matter what happens, I'm going to ride for you, right? I get sent off. I get locked up. Everything was fine at first. And then she became angry. It went from us laughing and joking to her hanging the phone up in my face, screaming at me, cursing at me. Because there was somebody else in her ear telling her lies. Oh, he knew he was going to prison. Oh, he just used you to get the money for a lawyer. Oh, you look stupid right now sending that dude that's locked up. She started to hold a grudge against me. She started to say things that were disrespectful to me on the phone. You know somebody's disrespecting you when you call over there. And she wants you to know that your homeboy's there. How's my homeboy doing that? You have been disrespected past what the definition of disrespect can cover. And there's nothing you can do about it. You hang up that phone and you look around you and there's stupidity all around you. People doing things that you don't agree with, things that irritate you. And the disrespect you just received on that phone might be the reason you hurt somebody in here today. Let's get back to the guards. I've had guards walk by the cell and you need something. You rely on these guards for a lot of things. Because you can't just do what you want. Like I said, you're going to wait. When you need a door open, that guard is the one that opens it. 
If you need anything done inside the prison, you're going to need what's called a request form. You have to fill this request form out and submit it. And if it gets approved, then they'll let you do whatever it is, whether it be, I need to see medical, I need to see the chaplain, I need to see a psychiatrist, I'd like to send some property home. But these guards have the power. I've had guards walk by the cell. Hey, man, can I holler at you? I need some toilet paper. Not right now, Williams. What you mean not right now? I ain't got time right now, Williams. You know what I mean? Figure it out. I had a guard tell me one time to wipe my ass with a sock. I said, hey, man, I'm sitting on the toilet as he walks by the door. Hey, see you. He stops. Come on, man. Why are you going to stop me while you using the bathroom? I had to use the bathroom. I need some toilet paper. I ain't got nothing for you. All he's got to do is walk over there and open the closet. That's how easy it is. He's got the keys. He's got the power. You know what I mean? Like, like he, man, he's got the power. He can walk over there, turn the key, reach in there, grab me a toilet roll, toilet paper. Here you go, Williams. Nah. Wipe your ass with a sock. Just disrespect you. What did you just say? I said, wipe your ass with a sock. I'm not wiping my ass with no sock. Well, I don't know what to tell you then. Figure it out. And he keeps it moving. So now when these doors pop, I got to look this dude face to face that just treated me less than a human. And there are going to be times that you are treated less than human. It is an inhumane environment at times. Guards will take you from the hole. And I took almost a year full of freezing cold showers, which in the summertime, it was cool. It was great because back there in the hole, we didn't have no AC. So you are drenched in your sleep with sweat. You're drenched when you wake up. Because you're sweating, your sheets start to smell like urine because your, your sheets are literally soaked. So in the summertime, it was cool to go over there and take a cold shower. You look forward to it. But in the wintertime, however cold it is outside, it's that much colder inside because you're inside of a concrete room with no heat. They would lead you over there. This goes back into being treated inhumane. They would lead you over to the shower in handcuffs, back up to the door, put your hands through the, it's a, they shut the metal door, the grate, padlock it, and padlock you in this little small four by four shower area. Put your hands to the door and they uncuff you. You would turn the water on and the water would be cold or just as cold as whatever the temperature was outside. It would be the ground temperature. So if it's 16 degrees outside, that water coming out that pipe hitting your body is 16 degrees. It would sting. It would burn. You're freezing as it is. You're already cold. And now you're standing there naked. And the water that's hitting you is the coldest thing you could ever experience next to just running out and jumping in a lake or a river full of ice. And the guards, man, can y'all please do something to turn the water up? <laughs> you don't like our water temperature, don't come to prison. We'll clown you. I seen a, and I told this story, y'all need to go watch it. An officer by the name of C.O. Brantley, real greasy with his mouth. He used to love to talk fly to dudes. Get to running his mouth to an inmate one day. He would call dudes bitch, boy, whatever he wanted to. Bigger dude, because he was a guard, didn't nobody want to put their hands on him, even though there had been several situations where it almost happened. He got the right one one day, called him bitch, called him all these different names, squared up with him, right in the middle of the pod, put his hands up and was ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this dude, right? Everybody broke it up because we were going to wreck. We didn't want to be locked down because dude beat the guard up. Short time later, they're letting wreck out. Dude stabs the guard multiple times going out the back wreck. Dude. I was five feet from the whole thing and watched it take place. Messed me up. I'm not going to say the guard deserved to be stabbed like he was or attacked like he was, but I will say that he played a major part in it. I will say that he had it coming and I expected it to happen a lot sooner than it did. You will be treated in a manner that you've never experienced before. If you were a lawyer on the streets, it doesn't matter. Have all the money in the world on the streets, it doesn't matter. Who you were in the streets does not matter. You're going to be disrespected and you're going to be treated like everybody else. 
And you better hope and pray that you don't come across a guard that has a grudge and that does not like you because then you're really going to figure out what disrespect is real fast. Let's get into the next one. Coming in at number one, the anxiety and PTSD that comes along with being incarcerated. Shout out to my homeboy, Chuck. What up, Chucka? Somebody else spoke on the anxiety and PTSD that comes along with being incarcerated. Not only while incarcerated, but afterwards. Another YouTuber, I'm going to give her her flowers while she's here. Amazing channel. Make sure you go check out Jessica Kent on their YouTube. Well, she did a video on it, and I she nailed it. She hit the nail on the head to the T. The anxiety of being incarcerated, the anxiety of everything that you're gonna go through starts the moment those blue lights come on, starts the moment those handcuffs are put on your wrist. And it never fully goes away from that moment after. Unless maybe you do one night in jail and you never return back, then it's short-lived. But there's going to be so much anxiety in that night, more than you've ever experienced in your life. Take all the anxiety you've ever felt, multiply that times a thousand, and that's how that night's going to be for you. Now, over extended periods, long stays, long periods of incarceration, anxiety never goes away. You don't recognize it as anxiety because you've become used to dealing with it. Red Bull, pause. You don't see it. You don't even know that it exists. But it's there. You're in a hostile, crazy environment where things jump off on the regular. Where violence is just part of your life. Where things you've never known anything about are now a day-to-day -day norm. It causes an anxiety that forever sticks around. Watching the evil that man can do. Watching someone else be victimized or hurt comes with a certain level of anxiety. Even if you're not the victim, just seeing it will get your heart beating in your chest. Will cause you to get all jittery feeling like, which way do I go? And you usually freeze up because there's nothing you can do about it. Long after that situation is over, you don't realize that there's anxiety associated with it. You don't realize that you have PTSD from what you just saw, but it's there. From that point forward, anything that slightly resembles whatever it is you saw or you went through yourself, anything that slightly resembles that is going to kick your anxiety into overdrive. When things don't go your way or anything's out of the ordinary, your anxiety is going to come into place. People listen to these stories I tell. And, you know, we laugh, we joke and stuff, but the bottom line is, is the things I went through and the things I saw, they stay here. When telling them stories, my anxiety is in overdrive. Sometimes for days afterwards, I'll take a break from doing videos just because the toll the last video had on me. Just from telling it, the anxiety and the PTSD comes to life. I know for a fact that I have. Somebody asked me in the comment section, how do you know you have PTSD? I've seen a psychiatrist. I've seen a psychologist. Reoccurring thoughts, um, avoidances, all these things combined. The things I saw, witnessed, went through, the years of anxiety, stress, the not knowing, the fighting, the uninevitable caused the PTSD. My psychologist said, chances are, you had PTSD way before you ever became incarcerated because I grew up in an abusive household. I grew up around a man that physically harmed all his children, that would take his fist and punch you as hard as he could in your face, or that would hit you with any object laying around. So we walked on eggshells in my household. I make my way into the prisons, the jails, the detention centers, these facilities, and I've already got anxiety from what I go through at home. So I come in with anxiety. The anxiety turned all the way up when they put those handcuffs on me. 
because I don't know what's going to happen. The anxiety associated with what's going to happen when I go to trial. How long am I going to sit here before I go to trial? Why hasn't my lawyer contacted me? Did the man just tell me to take a 27-year plea bargain? Is he crazy? The anxiety of going in that courtroom and not knowing the outcome. The anxiety of not knowing who's going to leave you, who's going to ride with you, and not knowing what's going to happen from second to second. You could walk down on that wreck yard and it'd be just a normal day and the wind can blow and you can feel the violence in the air. Does that sound crazy? You can sense it and instantly your anxiety kicks in. Calm, collect on the surface, but inside your heart's racing because you don't know what's about to happen. You feel in the air, is this something directed towards me? Is this because me and old boy got to arguing the other day? Does everybody know something's about to happen to me? You look over, you see some scared dude. You see a crowd of dudes going at him. And your anxiety kicks in because you can only imagine what he's going through or what's about to happen to him. The anxiety that I carry from day to day from being incarcerated is real. The PTSD that I deal with day to day is real. In the middle of a Walmart, I can be sitting on my couch watching TV and something come across the TV that brings up a memory of something that happened while I was incarcerated or something I saw while I was incarcerated. Everybody else is enjoying the movie and my heart's beating. I'm breathing heavy and I'm over there going through something and nobody understands. 62 degrees in my house and a sweat beating up on my forehead. And I'm not even paying attention to what the movie's got going on anymore because I'm thinking about what's happened in the past. The anxiety of getting a new cellmate. You never know who they're going to put in the cell with you. You could go from having a halfway decent day, a halfway decent bid, and they put some racist piece of crap in the cell with you that you just absolutely hate. This guy could be white, he could be black, he could be of any race. Racism who comes in all shapes, colors, sizes, and forms. Or they could put somebody in the cell with you that you're not compatible with. Now the anxiety comes into play. Because you know, yeah, this ain't going to end good. It's going to end with me putting my hands on him, him putting his hands on me. Win, lose, or draw, we'll have to see what it is. Anxiety is pretty much associated to everything in prison. That's not positive. And let me tell you this. There's not a whole lot of positivity in prison. You will meet some positive guys. Some guys that are you have good heads on their shoulders that uplift your spirits. But for the most part, it is a dark, gloomy, and negative environment. The PTSD takes place in there as well. You can't tell me that after watching a man get stabbed or watching a man get bludgeoned with something or assaulted, that the next time you see something that slightly resembles what you saw in that day, that immediately, internally, you don't start to panic. Because this is familiar. You know how this is going to end. It may not even end that way. But the PTSD and the anxiety kicks in, and instantly, that's where your mind goes. I learned at a young age that if we're going to argue, for me to go ahead and strike. And I don't agree with people putting their hands on one another. I don't agree with people fighting or solving violence, solving issues with violence. We should all be smarter than have to lash out and physically harm somebody to get our point across. But I learned a long time ago that standing there arguing with somebody, all that does is give them the opportunity to reach out and punch you in your face. All it does is give them the upper hand and the time to hurt you. So now... And especially while incarcerated, the moment I seen that there was any type of friction or we had any type of problems, I am obligated to just pull back on everything I have and hit you because I'm not going to let you do that to me first. I can't stand there and just wait for you to strike me. I did that before and it ended bad. So when that anxiety kicks in, the moment any traces of something familiar surface you become the worst version of yourself. Like I told you, the anxiety will start 
the very moment you realize you're in trouble, and you don't even recognize that for the rest of your incarceration, even if you don't feel it, you don't feel anxious, you don't feel none of it, it's there. It's there when you're sleeping and you hear a noise and you move because you don't know what's going on around you. It's there when somebody's standing too close to you or you and somebody walk and bump into each other because instantly you expect it to go to violence. Anxiety is by far, that associated with PTSD, is by far one of the worst parts of being incarcerated. The fact that you always feel like the unknown is about to happen. The fact that you always feel like worst case scenario is right around the corner. The fact that you feel that you have absolutely no control over what's going on in front of you and all going on in front of you and all you can do is sit back, get ready, and prepare for it. I make these videos with a purpose. 100% with a purpose. I do not want anyone to walk in these shoes live that life through these videos if you're intrigued by it watch the videos if you want to know about it watch the videos but don't go out and do something that's going to make you part of a video or make you capable of producing these type of videos there was nothing good about the 10 years I spent locked up except for the fact that I found myself and found who I was I met some good guys along the way but being locked up is all bad it is stupid it means that you can't last out here in these streets it means that you don't do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it you go the other route and I get it I know what it is to be hungry and have to come up with some money. I know what it is to have eviction notices coming and the door lock's about to be changed and you gotta come up with the rent. But the bottom line is, for a lot of us, we are responsible for being in that situation to begin with. Not all of us. I know things do happen where everybody's not got money. Every, some people got lots of responsibilities and they got to pick and choose what they can take care of. But I can tell you now that getting out here and doing the wrong thing to take care of those situations is going to make it a hundred times worse. Because the people that depend on you to take care of them are the ones that suffer and are left behind with no one to take care of them when you're locked up. And then they become responsible for trying to take care of you. So there you have it. My top five. Aside from that, y'all already know it is Friday, 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 which means it is payday, payday, payday. Got to get this money. Got to get the guys paid. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Stay tuned. More coming soon. I cannot wait for the weekend, man. It's time for me to get up out of here and get home. I'm going live this weekend, 100% facts. It is proven. Make sure y'all check for that as well. Anyways, these jails, the detention centers, these prisons, these facilities, they're all just crazier worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams, Let's Live Life. And to all my real ones, and there are some real ones watching, because y'all still watching me. Now y'all know how we do. Salute.